What's up, Hubble Power Ass Crew? Today, we're going to finally do the test of the onboard air system. Let's go check it out. So how are we going to do this? I'm going to deflate them 35s. But before we get into the let's test the air compressor, let's go over what was involved in getting all this done. Now we're going to go over a brief summary of each component that it took to make all this happen. Now the heart of the system is your Sandin AC compressor. Now, there's a couple different ways to do this. One, you have an external oil source. As you pour oil into this little reservoir, and it'll suck it in through the intake port, and it'll oil all the parts on the inside. That's not the route I went. The route I went, I took the whole compressor apart, cleaned it all the junk out of it, and inside there, all the bearings, thrust bearings, and stuff like that inside there, I greased all that up, and it works absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so the only thing I have to do Keeping an air filter on it, that's all I gotta do. I don't have to put any type of uh, external oil source or anything. Whatever I wanna use it, I simply turn it on with the engine running and it does its job. Down in the description, there's a video on how I did that modification, so you guys go check that out. Next in this whole system would be your air manifold system. That is your air switch, your pop-off valve, whenever you build up too much pressure, you'll release it, keep from blowing any of your hoses up. This right here is another quick connect for your air hoses. Then, of course, your air gauge. And obviously, I have no pressure in it right now because, well, I've got air down. Then, this goes back to my rear bumper. My rear bumper happens to be, as you see right there, hose comes into that. And right here is my quick connect to hook my airline up. And over here to the front, side of my winch is the other quick connect for the front so that's the plumbing side of everything the hoses go to their perspective places coming off here I came off of this came down with a copper line it curves under the compressor and comes to right here why did I do that whenever you compress air it generates a lot of heat so if you take your hoses here connected directly to a bar fitting coming off that right there, that heat being generated off the AC compressor can actually eventually deteriorate the rubber of your lines and they'll start popping off, start cracking, and doing things like that. So, so coming off this right here, with just a short section of copper coming down under the compressor into here, the copper dissipates heat very well. So that allows it to cool off before it gets to the rubber connection that goes from here up to the manifold. Down in the description, I'll provide a link to the plumbing as well. So since we mentioned the air manifold, you can't mention the air manifold without involving this switch. The switch is part of the electrical side of this whole onboard air system. The body of the compressor here bolts to the bracket here. This bracket also been bolted to the engine, which gets your ground side of your battery. Coming off this wire here, which actually is connected to the clutch back in behind here, comes over to this, which is your ace, uh, which is your pressure switch that tells the compressor when to come on and off. This particular pressure switch is 95 on, 125 off. Now you can get different pressure switches to kick on and off wherever you want them, but I really recommend not really going above 125 PSI because really there's no point in it. Uh, if you go above the 125, bear in mind that it makes your compressor work harder and longer. And also, all your connections here, they're going to be under more pressure, obviously, eventually creating more leaks. So that's up to you. But my kicks on at 95 PSI, off at 125. Now, here's my inline fuse. It goes all the way through there. It goes on through the firewall here to a switch I have inside. And here's my switch. Well, all I do is hit power on, hit that right there, my air compressor kicks on. Pretty simple. Now, you don't have to use these fancy switches like this. I got these because they actually fit in this little slot. This particular area right here, for those people who have hard tops, that's your defrost is going to be in one position, your rear windshield wiper is going to be in another, so on and so on. If you cut those little slots out behind this little plastic trim plate, these switches snap right in there. So that's the reason I went with these switches. My starter here, see if I hit that, and you know, my Jeep's in gear right now, but if I was to bump that, it'll kick my starter on. It doesn't start the Jeep, but it kicks the starter over. My ignition is on a different separate switch. Now I'm going to move this push to start to a different kind of switch in a different location. And in place of this switch, I'm going to put a winch switch in out to go right there. So down in the description will be a link to the electrical video. Go check it out. Now the next video in the series will be all about setting up your belt for this. 
Of course, whenever you have a, a non-AC rig, what happens is your belt comes off the bottom of this pulley here that comes down to the alternator. Well, whenever you add the AC, what happens, that belt, I'm trying to find you guys a good camera angle here. It comes off the bottom of this factory pulley here, it'll come over the compressor, down to your alternator, then it will go down to your crank. But that's the wrong way of doing it. You don't want that because it, you get too much, too little contact on your um, alternator pulley. So you have to add this pulley right here. This pulley and this pulley are the same, are the one the same. So you can effectively go to the auto parts store, buy another replacement pulley here, add it down there, and you have what you need to set up your belt. This also is a separate video and I will link it up below. I will show you the part number to this pulley and the belt I used and how I went through all the process figuring it out. You need a bolt, you pick up from the hardware store here and I'll tell you what size you get and I'll also show you the part number of this and your belt like I just said. Not a hard conversion, but it's not a drag and drop. I mean, my first impression was it was that I could just simply throw an AC belt on, meaning a Jeep that come out of the factory with AC. I thought it was going to come underneath this. It would come down there and off the alternator and down. I realized that belt was extremely too long because at the time I didn't realize I had to have this pulley. So after some research, I realized, hey, wait a minute. There's an extra pulley here for AC rigs. So that's how that come into play. But again, down in the description, I'll drop a link. You guys check out that video, which gives you all the details you need to do, do the belt conversion. Now that we've gone through all the components it takes to set up an onboard air system, let's get on with the test. So for this part of the test, what we're going to do is we're going to deflate that 35. Now, technically, they're not 35. They're a metric equivalent 315, 75, 16s, uh, which is a metric equivalent to a 35, 1250. So we'll deflate that sucker down, we're going to air it right back up, and we're going to time it to see how long it takes. Now I'm sure down in the comments somebody's going to ask, hey man, what kind of tires are those? Those are tread rights. Tread rights is that company that does what some people call them are retreads. Uh, they're not retreads. They're remold. And what they'll do is they'll take strip all, like this, say for instance, the carcass of this right here, the inside belt, stuff like that. And just say the carcass was a BF Goodrich, for instance. They'll strip all the sides, the tread are here, they'll mill it all off, put it in the machine and spin it, mill it, get all the old rubber off. Then they'll take wrap new rubber around this, put a new sidewall onto it. Actually the sidewall goes first, and then they'll wrap new rubber here. They put it in a special uh, oven slash mold thing that clamps together on it and it bakes the tire which you know, forms all this. Because you can see the mold marks here, here, where it all clamped together and created the lug pattern and sides and stuff like that. I've actually run them for a few years now and I got no issues with them. They actually run really, really good. So, take my cap off. Now I'm gonna keep this little bag right here in my Jeep all the time. It's gonna have a bow stem tool where you can change the bow stem without taking the tire off and I'll demonstrate that later in a different video. Here's my air gauge slash tool thingy. I'll be clamping that on there. And more valve stems, a sharpie marker. Only reason I keep a sharpie marker in there, say for instance, if I had a, a nail through the tire right here and I need to turn it to a certain location to you know, clean it, plug it, and stuff like that, I take the sharpie marker and say, well, it's right right there. That way I got a mark on the tire to be able to say, okay, that's where I need. plug is whenever I rotate the tire around or for positioning or whatever. So before we do this, I want to see how much air pressure I'm running because I like my air pressure where it's at right now. I am running at about 25 PSI. Yep, it's about 24 actually. This whole thing with, you must run 35 PSI or 34, because you know, a lot of your manufacturers, see, never inflate past 40 PSI to see the beads. This whole thing, if you read the side, your sidewall, it says 35 PSI. That is a suggestion more so than anything, because what it all boils down to, depending on the weight of your rig, now this could be a Jeep, car, truck, whatever, does not matter. It's all dependent upon how flat your tires are wearing. If you've got too much air pressure, your tire will crown in the center, wearing the center of your tire out too fast. If you've got too little air pressure, your tire will cup and you'll wear out the outside faster. So you actually need to play with your tire pressure to figure out exactly where does it need to be. 
for your particular vehicle. And the air pressure can actually be different from the front to the back. Why? You've got an engine up front, so you got more weight. In the back, no engine, less weight. See what I'm saying? All right. So let's get this bad boy deflated and see what happens. So there's a couple different ways you can deflate your system. Like this thing right here, it clamps onto your valve seal like that. And I can take this button and bleed it down like that right there. But since I want it to go completely flat, that is going to take forever. So, option two. Take that off. This tool right here is a Schrader valve tool. That inside there is a Schrader valve. You take this right here, go inside there, and turn it. Little by little, take it slow and easy. So the reason I say that is, if you take it out too fast, not watching what you're doing, that straighter valve inside there that you're in the process of taking out, you'll blow that sucker across the ground somewhere, and then you'll be looking for one. But luckily, I've got a couple valve stems extra, so. So there's your straighter valve. That's what keeps the air inside there. Oh no, I am dipping this flat tire. That is such a catastrophe. Wow, that's deflating right over here. You drive down there's a path cutting right down through there and through here and you can come up right there it's kind of a little steep incline i've had my buddy's jeep out here playing with it uh we put he put a locker in his front it's a 2000 model tj and his rear diff is open but his he's got a locker up front as he was coming up through there he had to give us some throttle to get up that hill because it's kind of steep and of course there's no fresh grass it was slick he's got his locker in the front of it now so we need to bring it back up here See how much that front locker done for him. Again, it's an open rear diff, Dana 35, Dana 30, but just doing a front locker on his rig, we need to come back up here and test and see how it did. Old tractor. I'm gonna let y'all guess about that thing. Oh, look, I got a flat. Oh my gosh, what do I do? Okay, let's put our Schrader valve back in. People, I'm right-handed and I'm holding the camera with the right hand, so coordination is not my thing at the moment. Okay, so whenever you put your straighter valve back in, so I'm turning, boom, it stops right there. Take and you just give it a little snug. Don't crank it hard because you don't want to tap it inside your valve core. So I'll put that back in my air tool bag. Get my air hose out. And so we need that in right there. We're going to connect it to my front port here. Take off a little protective cover. I really recommend you guys covering up your valves because you don't want to get any kind of crud inside there. And well, yeah, it caused you all kinds of issues. So now we we'll stamp this in place. Bring this on this side of the stinger hoop. See, that snaps in place there. Try to get that sleeve back up on there. Okay, I'm gonna get my tripod real quick. Snap that on there. Take this. Pipe it onto the valve stem. So now I'll have to start the Jeep, turn the air compressor on, push the button, air this baby up. Oh, before I do that, there's one more component to the system I forgot to tell you guys about. This here is a hand throttle. What we're going to do with this is we'll get the Jeep started up. I'll pull this up just a little bit, which turns, which in turn pulls on the throttle body blades, opens the throttle up a little bit, therefore making your RPMs go higher. The reason we're doing that is when you make your RPMs go higher, you're going to turn the compressor faster. When you turn the compressor faster, you're going to get more velocity. Therefore, you uh, pump that air up on that tire much quicker. Uh, you only want your RPMs about 1,500. Uh, 1500 2000 rpms or so so what's gonna happen I'm gonna set it all up and since my air gauge out here 
right here we have this little lever. I can push this, psh, air up the tire, and I can watch the gauge, and that can accurately get a time on how fast it's airing everything up. So, also for the throttle control, what that does, it pulls out here, right there. It goes to your throttle blade under here. So when you pull that lever, it pulls the throttle backwards, opens your throttle, and increases your RPMs. Yes, there's a video on that as well down in the description go check it out now now that we got that component covered let's get back to the test start her up I got my throttle control trying to block his life so you guys see what's going on. My throttle control has got this set up about, a, I don't know, 15. So I pulled my throttle control. So I pulled my hand throttle and my RPMs are sitting at about 16, 1700 RPMs or so. So we're going to leave it right there. Now we're going to blow up at 35 and see what we get. Let you guys watch as I increase the RPMs by my hand throttle so you can see how it works. Pulled it a little bit more. I'm trying to put it right about 2,000 RPMs. About 19 right there. A little more. Okay, 2,000 RPMs right there. Now, let's go blow up a tire. Now, let's go and inflate that 35 and see how fast it goes.
this. Okay, there's my pressure gauge. You're sitting at about 29, 30 pounds or so. If you need to bleed off any pressure, say, oh my gosh, I put too much air in it. This little button right here, just push it. And you can bleed your pressure down. Oop. Okay, that's about 24 pounds right there. Sweet. I was about to edit this video together, then I realized something. Someone's going to ask me, do you have to have the throttle control? Do you have to idle it up to blow up a tire? Absolutely not, you don't. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that tire at idle. Pull the Schrader valve. So while my tire is going flat, let's hook up the airline. Right this side of the stinger. Hooked up. Oh no, I got a flat. Okay, put the Schrader valve back in. And again, once it makes contact inside the threads right here, you feel that snug, just give it a little bump. It don't have to be tight. Oop, got a flat tire. Let's blow her up. All right, kick this baby out of gear. I got the wheels chopped so it don't roll off. Contact that. And again, I just want to check my shifter. Okay, my throttle control. All the way down. Start her up, turn the compressor on, and check out my idle, 800, 900 RPMs, you gotta leave it like that.
Okay, let's shut her down for the moment. See the acupressure, turn it off, turn it off. Two minutes and 11 seconds with an idling at 800 RPM. Not too shabby. Now let's try one more test. I'm gonna get me a die grinder. <laughs> try that out. So for our first die grinder test, I'm just gonna go ahead and kick the compressor on at idle and see how it keeps up. And then we'll kick it up to about 1500, 2000 RPMs and check, see how it keeps up then. So first test at idle. Okay, so now I'm going to bump the I love to about 2,000 RPMs. Hands up. Okay, what about 2,000 RPMs? Shut her down real quick. Turn my RPMs down. Compressor off. Master switch off. Ignition off. Okay, so hmm, what do we think about this? Do I think it'll work? Yes. Now, if I was on the trails having to use that die grinder, put a cutter head on it, something like that, would it be like, can I really put the pressure to it to cut? Probably not. But will it get the job done in a trail situation? Yeah, it'll get the job done. Yeah, I'm not even gonna go there. But anyway, will it get the job done? Absolutely it would. I was taking my finger on the collet, kind of rubbing the collet, kind of like trying to stop it in a way. Really wasn't putting a whole lot of pressure to it. It definitely still had some power. So if you had a cutter head on it, a little small, you know, two inch head or something like that, get that metal Linux ones, not the exploding ones that's gonna shatter all in your face. And I'll pop a link down below uh, for the metal Linux cutting blades. They're awesome, they're safe. That's the main thing, they're safe and they last. So, pretty awesome little setup. I like my onboard air. Blows the tires up, even at idle, two minutes, 11 seconds or something like that, wasn't it? Not too shabby. Kick it up about 2,000, it was a minute 46 or something like that. Uh, is able to run a die grinder at idle and at 2000 RPMs, so it's doable. I can handle that. I like my new toy. Sweet! One thing I'm realizing though, I'm definitely going to have to go ahead and put in my water air separator because I don't know if you can see it or not, but I had a lot of water coming through the line. You see the, look real close. See the condensation on the end right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that water separator in. And where do I put that in at? Let me show you. Probably even replace this right here because I mean the water oil separator is also a filter itself. So probably replace this with it. So that's what I'm gonna do. Now to be totally fair, it's hot out here. I'm guessing probably upper 80s and it's humid. Then you get compressed air that creates moisture in the lines like that. So the water oil separator, yeah. I'll put it in, but like I said, I'll take that filter out that's currently installed and put that in place. So, 
Now, if you want to go ahead and incorporate that into your system as you build your onboard air, I really suggest that. Okay, sweet, sweet. Now, at the beginning of this video, I talked about each one of the components that makes this whole system work. Each one of those has its own video, and I'll drop them down below in the description, along with the playlist. Where therefore, you can click on that playlist, and you can watch all of them in one sitting. Instead of go click on one, come back, click again, click on one, watch it, come back again, so all that. If you've got playlist configuration, it'll play them all all the way through. So I'll include that link as well. And each one of those videos has the Amazon links to, their, to any of the parts that you may need to put this kit, put the system together. It's not hard, so don't let it intimidate you. The AC compressor, uh, as I've mentioned in the mod of the modding of that AC compressor, it needs to come off a certain rig because on the YJs you got a certain bolt pattern for the AC compressor. Like if you pull one off of a Grand Cherokee ZJ or something like that, it's liable to have the wrong bolt pattern. I think they're a little bit, I don't know if they're bigger or smaller. I think they're smaller, but I don't hold me to that. I have to look at C. But I used a little cardboard template off my YJ bracket, took it to the junkyard with me, so therefore I knew I matched up the proper size uh, bolt configuration. But I talked about that in the compressor mod video. So everyone, if you enjoyed this uh, video and this video series, hit that thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, leave some cool comments. I'm doing lots of cool stuff, so you don't want to miss it. Peace out. Later, y'all.